African-American youngsters, too many of them, certainly not all, are not having the experiences and being exposed to the influences and having the benefit of the resources that foster and facilitate human development, they are not developed, that they're not achieving their full human potential. That is basically the cause for the gaps that we're seeing. At Brown University, where I'm a professor, I uh, teach a course called Race and Inequality in the United States. It's ongoing right now. And I started with a review of some of the data that are uh, reflected in this paper about the extent of racial inequality, and I challenge people straight ahead. I say, you know, what's the cause of this, okay? So there are various stories out there, and one of the stories is an unrelenting, overbearing, white supremacist society won't give black people a chance. And I ask them, do you believe that seven in 10 black children born to a woman without a husband, that fact, is due to an unrelenting white supremacy. Do you really believe that? Do you believe that homicide, victimization and homicide perpetration at an order of magnitude higher rate amongst African American young men as compared to similar white men is a, how? Explain to me, tell me what the causation is. I, I challenge them. But, but they're saying and they don't why? riot. My point yeah, is they don't yeah, riot. Yeah. I mean, they are a little bit stunned mm -hmm. because they're not hearing that kind of uh, challenge uh, in most of their classes, but I'd say 60, 70 percent of them are challenged by it. They're, they're not, you know, just reflexively dismissive of it. Now, among the activists who are not in my classroom, <laughs> <laughs> but if we were to invite you, heaven forbid, <laughs> to come and give a lecture would be present in large numbers, <laughs> there's a different story. There's no, as it were, talking to some of those people. But I'd say you just draw a kid at Brown University at random. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not it's not out of, qu out of the question that you can uh, get them to take seriously some of these kinds of things. Well, let's talk about some of the arguments they make, um, because uh, to be fair, uh, many of even the activists don't deny the antisocial behavior that we see among particularly uh, low income uh, minorities. Um, but they say, before we start talking about that, before we start talking about black behavior, we need to talk about white behavior. We've got governors in blackface. We've got congressmen spouting off about white nationalism. Professor, why are you talking to me about out of wedlock childbirths? That is the real problem. Until we can eliminate that, don't talk to me about learning gaps uh, and, and, and the black role in that, we, we, we can't get there yet until we handle this issue with white people. They need to get their act together. Don't talk to black people about getting their act together first. What a horrible argument that is. <laughs> no, I, I understand that people are gonna make it. Yes, that will be said. That's somewhat of a caricature, but not much. Um, and what a horrible argument that is. Uh, you just made white people, the ones whom you say are the implacable, racist, uh, indifferent, don't care uh, oppressors, into the sole agents of your own delivery. Really? If they are, in fact, so racist, what's the point in talking to them? I, I, I mean, th that, there's just a, a straight up logical contradiction in that posture. Uh, the oppressor is going to be the agent of my delivery if only I could get him or her to respond effectively to my moral appeals. I don't follow that at all. Now, as a matter of fact, I don't buy the hypothesis, the hypothesis being that uh, the fact that um, the uh, culture of Jim Crow segregation and uh, white domination in um, some parts of American society had a long, long um, you know, uh, shadow that could be seen even in the decades of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s in American society, reflected in the fact that some prominent Democrats in Virginia <laughs> would appear to have been participants in a remnant of that. That's true. As an African American, I'm not especially you know, happy about that. But it's hardly a, an implacable force holding you back. And what I have to say to such people, and I expect that um, there may be some here who would find this uh, uh, problematic, but what I have to say is such people is grow up. Nobody's coming and save you. Grow up. You're just dodging your responsibility. You're just looking for an excuse. And uh, sadly, too many in the establishment, in the media, in the academy, 
and so on, are willing to play along. But you know what? When it comes to their children and their lives, they'll defend the uh, norms of decency and civil behavior that they know are essential to the development and the success of people whom they care about. But when it comes to you and your people, uh, they're willing to nod along with your nonsense. Grow up. But uh, we're not. <clears throat> I mean, these are people in position of authority, positions of power, congressmen, governors, uh, business owners. Yeah. Um, and the argument is that they run the system by and large, and they are in a position to hold people back, to discriminate on a systematic, in a systematic way, and that that is what explains these racial disparities that we see. I mean, you're, you're an economist. You deal uh, in, 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 in facts and data, empiricism, mm -hmm. logic. Uh, we've, we have persistent statistical gaps in this country. They've been around for a long time. Is that, in and of itself, evidence of racism? But for racism, would we see more racial parity when it comes to home ownership or income or education levels? Because that is one of the arguments uh, being made out there. Well, that's why I say c culture causation and responsibility, because the causation question is important. It's a difficult question. It's a matter of social science analysis, but it's, it's really very important. Um, so the way I look at it is, I mean, there are basically two narratives uh, that people concerned about persisting racial inequality can adapt, uh, can adopt. Uh, one of them is a biased narrative of the sort that you're uh, outlining here, you know, uh, racism and white supremacy have done us wrong. Uh, we won't be able to get ahead until they relent. Uh, we have to continue to press for uh, reform of American society, of white American society to that end. But the other narrative, which I take very seriously and for which I think there's a ton of evidence, I'm calling the development narrative. I'm saying that you have to look at the processes by which people come to acquire skills, traits, habits, and orientations that uh, lend themselves to successful participation in American society. And to the extent that African American youngsters, too many of them, certainly not all, um, are not having the experiences and being exposed to the influences and having the benefit of the resources that foster and facilitate human development, so much so that the statistics that you were alluding to are what they are, to that extent that they are not developed, that they're not achieving their full human potential. Uh, that is basically the cause for the gaps that we're seeing. And you know, these two different, crudely, uh, different orientations or predispositions point in two very different directions in terms of intervention and remedy. The first is, White America must reform itself. We need more of this or that, whatever the this or that is of the latter day agenda of the race reformers. We need more of this or we need more of that. White America must reform itself. Racism must end. You see it in the New York Times every day. Um, the other, however, the development narrative, both puts more onus on the responsibilities of African Americans to be engaged in the processes that lead to uh, the development of full human potential and points towards solving the actual problems uh, rather than uh, this uh, kind of wishful argument, if we could double the budget for this program, then the homicide rate amongst young African American males would go down. If we can get this police officer or this police department under the investigation of the Department of Justice or convicted for their wrongful acts, then, then what? Then it'll be safe to walk around on the south side of Chicago at one o'clock in the, in the morning? Uh, well, 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 that, that leads me- That's wishful thinking.